and people just come in whenever they are ready. Um, so, um, on behalf of the Finnish Anthropological Society, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Penny Harvey is a professor of social anthropology at the University of Manchester. She also has held the position of professor at the University of Oslo and at the University of Bergen and has, uh, was recently elected to the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. Professor Harvey has carried out ethnographic research in Peru, Spain, and the UK. She has published widely on issues of politics and power, language and communicative practice, technology, infrastructure, and engineering expertise, materiality, and contemporary practices of modern statecraft. Her publications include the edited volumes, um, Roads, an Anthropology of Infrastructure and Expertise from 2015, Infrastructures and Social Complexity from 2016, and Anthropos and the Material from 2019. She's also an editor of the Routlet's book series, Culture, Economy and the Social. And central themes in her research have been, first of all, political formations in the Southern Peruvian Andes, including the intersections between modern state politics and the politics of everyday life. Another central theme in her research has been infrastructures and material politics. And she has also been studying nuclear imaginaries. And related to this, she is currently engaged in a long-term ethnographic project on nuclear life in the UK. Now, many of us uh, are familiar with Harvey's numerous publications. And I think anyone who gets interested in the anthropological or sociological study of infrastructures finds her publications and gets inspired by them. And the Finnish Anthropological Society has wanted to invite Professor Harvey to Finland for a long time. However, when we invited her to give the Edward Westermark Memorial lecture, lecture more than a year ago, we assumed that the event would take place in person. But the pandemic did not go away as quickly as we hoped for, and here we are online again. <laughs> but we do plan, however, to have Professor Harvey with us in Finland next spring in a workshop related to infrastructures. But now it's time for the online Edward Westermark Memorial Lecture. Penny Harvey's title today is Geology, Geology as Un conforming infrastructure, engineering, the containment of nuclear waste. After the lecture, there will be some time for comments and questions from the audience. We will record this lecture, but we will turn the recording off before the Q&A. But now, please, Professor Harvey, the Zoom is yours. Thank you so much, Mary, and um, thank you for all that you've done to make this happen even though we're still on zoom <laughs> we tried um and thank you for the to the society for the invitation to deliver this lecture it's a great honor and i'm really sorry that i can't be with you today it's quite strange to talk to people many of whom i've never met um and i can't see most of you but i can see a couple of people who i know so that's really nice um to keep me going um Anyway, I hope that we can manage to connect at some level around the basic questions of infrastructure, geology and sociality that I'm going to talk about today. The empirical focus of my lecture is a very particular infrastructure known in the UK as a geological disposal facility. Oops, just gonna try and get this working. Oh dear, sorry. There we go. Um, which I'm going to basically refer to as the GDF. It's a quite a big character in my story. So if I have to say geological disposal facility each time, it'll probably take an extra half hour. So from now on, it's the GDF. And the GDF that I'm engaging with conceptually and ethnographically has not yet been built in the UK. Unlike in Finland, where your GDF at Onkolo is well advanced, in the, G in the UK, there's still no identified site. And in some ways, the GDF is still an abstract conceptual possibility. However, the decision to deal with Britain's radioactive waste by means of geological disposal has already been taken. There is a government policy, a budget, an organizational hierarchy, 
considerable activity and investment in technical research and design and programs for community engagement. In other words, the institutional, financial, epistemic and engagement infrastructures that underpin the possibility of, an, of a GDF are already taking form and have already begun to shape what it is that the GDF can be, regardless of where the GDF is finally built. I'm interested in exploring what are at present unstable and constantly transforming spaces of compositional engagement. They raise many questions that I will explore today which I'll just outline before I get started because there's a lot of detail and you might wonder why the hell you're listening to it if I don't try and give you some sense of where it's headed. So when, for example, does an infrastructure come into being? How do we consider the relationship between a specific infrastructural form and its embeddedness in wider social relations? What other agencies and possibilities are drawn into the process of producing and sustaining a GDF? I'm particularly interested in the ways in which geology is enlisted as an active partner in this process and in the ways in which the geological reasoning and geological timescales connect to the pragmatic and technical reasoning of engineers. The GDF also raises questions of current interest to those working on the anthropology of waste, where considerations of the liveliness of the things we seek to dispose of is integral to the social and material transformation of human worlds. Nuclear waste, plastics and airborne particles are just some of the many things that threaten our contemporary biosphere. Nuclear waste is exceptionally lively. The proposed solution of the GDF rests on a series of novel alliances referred to by those involved as hosting relations. So that's the basic package that I want to explore. But before going any further, I want to just draw your attention to some key relational um, aspects um, of the parameters, if you like, of the UK government policy with respect to the GDF, just because they're basically the, the main characters in this story. So the GDF is a major state sponsored infrastructure project. Current policy expects the whole process from the initial searches to the final sealing of the facility to take up to 150 years and to cost more than 15 billion pounds and in many estimates more than double that. The process is managed by the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, the NDA. Um, this is a non-departmental government body that was set up in the Energy Act of 2004 to oversee the de decommissioning and cleaning up of the 17 publicly owned nuclear sites in the UK, which are here on this map. Um, and their job is to ensure that all waste products, both radioactive and non-radioactive, are safely managed. So they're, uh, they're the kind of organizing strategic um, body, but underneath them we have um, the radioactive waste management. And this is a subsidiary of the NDA. And this is the body that's actually charged with implementing the geological disposal facility. Um, and this is, if you like, the GDF is one character and the RWM, as I'll probably refer to them, um, is the other key character in this story. And I quite like this screenshot from their website, um, which um, says that they recognize in seeking to fulfill their mission, they need to engage with a wide range of stakeholders and respond to the concerns about radioactive waste. That's one of the things that I'll be looking at. Despite the ongoing political and organizational fluctuations, two key aspects of the policy have remained consistent since 2008. And these are the two that I've put here that the facility will be delivered via a consent based process that seeks to match a volunteer host community with a suitable geology. The important issue here is that despite the centralization of government control of financing, regulation, design and delivery, the specific design budget or timeline cannot be decided upon until a volunteer community has committed to hosting the facility. The nature of a suitable geology also remains open, as the optimal geology can only be defined in relation to the specific geological environment of the volunteer host community. The infrastructural challenge posed by the GDF is therefore clearly grounded in some level of acceptance of the need to align the social and the technical domains. The need for this alignment is quite obvious from the perspective of a critical anthropology of infrastructure, where the intrinsic sociality of the technical would be assumed from the start. But it poses a fundamental challenge to the engineering world, 
where projects of this size and scope are more usually couched in legal arrangements that allow co construction to go ahead, subject to basic parameters of so-called consultation and regulatory approval. This framing may well yet appear down the line, but for now it's not there. The communities are invited to engage in conversation with RWM, the Radioactive Waste Management Company, and to decide whether they would like to host a GDF. And um, here, this is the kind of timeline that um, RWM has produced, and it just um, helps you to see that they're, they're being encouraged to kind of start just by talking among themselves almost, beginning to form groups, getting, getting into stronger kinds of partnerships until after about 15 years, um, there will be a test of public support, at which point um, there's no going back. And there are amounts of money that kind of on the orange bar kind of clock in at certain times. So once you, once you form a partnership, um, you can be getting up to a million pounds a year for your community. And if you start getting kind of more intrusive um, investigations of your potential sites, then that might go up to about two and a half million pounds per year. So that given we're talking over a 15 year period, this is a considerable amount of money for local governments that don't really have anything much to work with otherwise. So given these circumstances, um, especially by which I mean the real open-endedness of the process at the moment, the GDF began to look like a rather enticing focus for ethnographic research, even if unfortunately for now I've been having to do it at a distance. So I was doing some ethnographic research around a nuclear PowerPoint down in southwest of England, um, but that all ground to a halt with lockdowns and um, so what I've actually what I've actually had the good fortune in some ways to um, have happen is that I became a member of a government advisory body. It's amazing how quickly you can become an expert. And I was explicit to explicitly invited to join this committee as an anthropologist in order to support the work of the committee, um, which is basically um, involved in advising and scrutinizing government action with respect to this um, GDF policy of working with communities. So in this role, I've been able to participate in many meetings with government, with local communities, with the decommissioning authority and with RWM. And I've learned a huge amount about nuclear worlds and from many different perspectives, um, not least because all my colleagues on the committee come from very different backgrounds of in law and engineering and um, and consultancy and even one Jerry Thomas there in molecular pathology. So there's lots of expertise um, that I have to engage with. And in terms of my contribution, I've tried to, to, to kind of help the committee think about some anthropological reflections on the relational dynamics of community formation, and particularly on the ways in which stakeholders, publics, citizens and communities emerge and transform over time in ways that challenge some of the fundamental assumptions about both the decision making process and the modes of representation that the policy tends to assume a stable entity so that you're going to consult your community but of course there isn't necessarily a community to consult until it comes into being so while while the um rwm definitely recognize that social engagement is incredibly problematic they don't have many tools at the moment for actually dealing with it um, as i say this committee is an independent body and the 12 members bring a range of professional expertise um, and very diverse views on nuclear power itself so not everybody agrees with the idea of nuclear power. Some do, some don't. But where we do have a shared commitment is to the idea that geological disposal is currently, and I emphasize that, is currently the safest available option for the long-term management of those high-level radioactive wastes that will pose a lethal threat to the biosphere for the next 100,000 years. And of course, the other thing I draw on very heavily in, in, in my engagement in this committee, but also in this research, is in thinking through the anthropology of infrastructural systems. Following an infrastructure as it comes into being, even when you're just focused on the first tentative steps, immediately faces you with the two classic ways in which infrastructures take form. That is, as things in themselves and as open-ended relational systems. And I put this image of Sellafield up to help you think about this as, as I'm speaking. There are an increasing number of excellent studies that show how things like roads, communications and transport systems, bureaucracies, energy systems, health services, or visual and sonic media can be approached as discrete entities, that is, as assemblages of materials, skills, knowledges, and values. Approaching an infrastructure as an assemblage is to ask what it's made of, what are the relations of its composition. So you could 
ask that question of the Sellafield site, which is quite contained, even though it does cover two square miles, you can ask what did it take to make that thing as an, as an energy infrastructure. But of course, this is only half the story. The other question is about its connective capacity. What does this infrastructure enable? What further connections does it forge, both planned and unplanned? Um, and here again, I like this slide because it actually points to the fact that, you know, four of the biggest um, nuclear risks and hazards in Europe actually exist on this site, and they were certainly not planned. And they, they are there as the unplanned consequence of how this plant was set up and run um, from the 1950s onwards. So these two aspects of the, of the assemblage and the connectivity um, pose two different questions that are quite fundamental to the imaginaries of the GDF. Firstly, how is the integrity of this assemblage, the GDF as thing, how is, how is the integrity of this assemblage maintained? And what are the unexpected consequences and the unplanned effects that this assemblage is already bringing into being? One of the hallmarks of the ethnographies of infrastructure is the attention given to the ways in which an infrastructure is never limited to the purpose for which it was designed. There are always unexpected consequences. Any engineered assemblage designed to facilitate specific contained modes of circulation also exists as a presence around which other unexpected circulations take form. Um, and I like this slide because it very explicitly points out that the storing of nuclear waste at surface levels, such as here at Sellafield, was never seen, as a, never imagined as anything that was going to happen, and yet they do have a lot of it um, to deal with. Um, so the work required to maintain the integrity of a specific infrastructural assemblage will always also fluctuate. Infrastructures connect, classify and channel material and conceptual flows, but they also leak. They intersect, they produce gaps which become the ground for new emergent relations. The infrastructure assemblage is thus never self-contained. Or to put it another way, both its internal and external relations are dynamic, which is why all engineered assemblages require ongoing practices of maintenance, repair and regeneration. It also explains why so many collapse, fail and or are simply abandoned and left to decay. This analytical approach to infrastructures as intrinsically open-ended and relational seems to fly in the face of the stated purpose of the GDF, which is to contain and isolate the radioactive matter for a period of at least 100,000 years, which is the time it would take for the radiated matter to decay to the levels of naturally occurring uranium ore. The safety case assumes that, in fact, you need a far longer time frame um, to ensure safety, and this is in fact being worked out and modelled in relation to a million year time horizon. The functionality of this waste disposal infrastructure is thus ultimately framed in relation to geological time. It will be designed as a fully passive system which will gradually move towards a point of closure from when on there will be no further human input or engagement. This is perhaps the classic utopian engineering dream one that moves to the total erasure of the human. But I want to suggest that the GDF has already started to produce some unexpected alternatives. Unlike the infrastructures where the engineers systematically erase human presence from the fields of engagement, where they want to speed ahead and implement their systems without interference, the GDF has the ambition to go beyond the realm of the biosphere entirely and to close off the way back. This radical shift from managed facility to passive system is to be achieved through the alignment of geological forces with those of an engineered infrastructure. A move, oh sorry, a move which also involves not only the deployment of the multi-barrier system that's shown here, but also a radical shift in temporal horizons from human time to the deep time of the subsurface. I've been intrigued by my conversations with geologists who are quite comfortable with the idea that below the ground, the GDF will become an open system. The movement of rock and of waste matter is assumed and responded to in every aspect of the design. However, it's an open-endedness that has to unfold beyond the realm of human engagement. So there is erasure, but it's not the kind of erasure that differentiates between different populations, at least different human populations, at least not at this point. This dream of total isolation will not be realized in my lifetime, but I want to suggest that it poses interesting challenges for how we as anthropologists, as anthropologists think beyond the human scale, into spaces that, while not totally unknowable, are designed to be totally inaccessible. 
It is the ambition to hand the process over to geology that I want to talk about today. In particular, I want to think about the ways in which anthropological engagements with geology have emerged in contemporary discussions of the challenges of the Anthropocene. And I want to engage the provocation posed by the geographer Nigel Clark, who asks about the possibility for a new geopolitics, as he puts it. Um, and this is his, the little quote that I thought I'd try to work with, a turn from issues hinging on territorial divisions of the Earth's surface towards the strata that compose the deep temporal Earth. It's not always exactly clear to know what that means, and that's partly what I'm going to try and explore or put some meaning onto that. His suggestion is that the discourses and imaginaries of geoengineering do not necessarily imply a retreat from politics, that is, from the human struggles over how best to configure our relationships to the earth at the surface, but could perhaps invite an extension of the scope of politics to include other than human agencies deep below the ground. Sorry. Okay. So, um, now I'm moving to politics on the surface before I take you back underground. Um, so this map is basically just to show where the waste currently is in the UK. So it's not exactly the same map as I showed you before, which are the ones which are under the um, authority of the nuclear decommission authority, because these ones are also, some of them are kind of live locations. And it's, I just use this to show the different kinds of materials that might end up in the GDF. So the spent fuel, there's, um, there's um, where the, you've got the ongoing the alive reactors, you've got um, the nuclear energy um, research and development plants, you've got defense facilities, um, places where fuel's being fabricated and enriched medical and industrial waste and other existing waste disposal facilities. So the ones I'm going to talk about in West Cumbria are kind of people not familiar with Britain is the kind of more or less the top of the light green section on the left. You can see the cellar field plant kind of labeled there and a bit later I'm going to talk about the northeast which is more or less in where it talks about Hartlepool more or less opposite the Sellafield site um, on the other side of England. Um, so yes the politics on the surface things have actually livened up on the surface over the past year with the formation of the first two working groups. Both of them are in West Cumbria in the Sellafield um, region um, an area where people are very familiar with nuclear power. Given that the radioactive wastes in question are currently in temporary storage in the area at the Sellafield plant, some people, including two local councils, are interested in exploring the opportunities that the GDF policy might offer them. In particular, the central place of the volunteer community in the policy seems to offer the possibility to strengthen the participation of local people in decisions over the future of these wastes. And of course, it will also bring the financial benefits for taking on a problem that in some ways they're already living within this area. Anyone can propose a working group. Um, so this is a kind of slightly more, it's almost a close up of the previous um, slide. The interested party could just be anyone, could be a landowner, a business, um, and they have to engage one local authority. And then with the support of the RWM, they have to get out and start engaging the wider population. And the idea is that they explain the process, talk about why they think it would be a good idea to have it in their area, begin to identify search areas for the potential location of the GDS. constituency who might be sufficiently interested to move to the next phase of creating a more formal partnership. In some ways, it's not put like that, but they, they are charged with trying to pull this community into being in a substantial enough way that they might actually vote um, to as volunteers for this for this in the test of public support. At this stage in the process, a more once they once they form a partnership, um, they they will go into a more system of the geology that would be undertaken alongside ongoing investments in in community engagement. And as I say, the end goal is really after about ten or fifteen years, if it takes that long. Although they hope it would happen sooner, it could take that long um, to hold a referendum. And if that was successful, and if the geology was deemed suitable, that would then be the green light for the legal agreement for the construction to begin. And at that point, the way in which the community can, can participate will be severely restricted, which is why this current moment is really interesting, because there's a point at which the community, um, they're looking for communities, and the communities are being given funds and quite a lot of 
leeway to um, to talk about how it might be done and how it might benefit them and, and how that what that might actually look like. Um, as I say, the trouble is that you've got to start pulling that community into being from the very beginning. So it's it's a very interesting process to watch it starting to happen. The RWM are fully engaged in supporting the formation of working groups. They try to explain the process and the rationale of the project. But at times, they are utterly bewildered and confused by the levels of pure anger that they encounter. One manager talked to me recently about being overwhelmed by an encounter with a couple who felt so outraged by the proposition of the GDF that they were literally unable to speak. Technical knowledge and the conviction that the GDF will deliver an invaluable public good is no help in these encounters with raw emotion. Now, West Cumbria has a history, not least a history where many have felt ignored or discounted by nuclear experts. Whether or not people have understanding of nuclear technologies, many have a deep knowledge of how particular projects undertaken in the name of the public good have actually landed in their communities in the past. These are social knowledges that developers need to learn about if they want to engage people who are often dismissed as either ideologically motivated or somehow as what they call hard to reach communities, people who don't engage and very, they struggle to draw them into conversation. A good example of what's going on in West Cumbria is given by the geographer um, Karen Bickerstaft, who worked on these issue-focused publics that came into being in West Cumbria around a former failed um, attempt to cite a GDF in the 1990s. She argues that among the legacies of this previous attempt is the enduring perception that there was little institutional capacity to engage in meaningful ways with local people. She notes that this concern about the absence of effective engagement is just as important, if not more important, than the concerns about safety that RWM feel actually much more comfortable to discuss. She also found that the paraphernalia of expertise, by which she means the reports, the evidence and the geological assessments, um, which in a sense a, a, a group like RWM will use all the time to try to prove their point and to show that things are safe and that they care. These very these very same things became closely associated with the sense that experts cut themselves off from people's everyday concerns. Attempts to educate people on the technical issues that shape RWM's faith in the GDF do not engage the memories and the social learning that have in turn shaped people's responses to the proposed new facility. So there are these two groups that are currently um, underway in West Cumbria, but in this kind of atmosphere of, of contestation as well. And then in late July this year, a colleague alerted me to an interview that had just been aired on BBC Radio Lincolnshire on the east coast of England. The local MP on the radio was expressing her dismay that RWM had been in discussion about the possibility of setting up a working group in the area without her involvement as the local elected parliamentary representative. The interview revealed that there was considerable confusion about who knew what, who had been consulted and, and, by, and when. By some accounts, these conversations had been going on for several years. The MP said that her inbox was flooded with concerns from local people. Her main aim was to ensure that there should be complete transparency. The interviewer pushed her on whether she would support the plans now that she knew about them. She responded that there were a great many unknowns. For example, there was a promise of 700 jobs a year, but how long would those jobs last for? Would artificial intelligence change everything and would, maybe the jobs wouldn't be forthcoming, robots would be doing them. She pointed out that the time frame for this process is really long. The working group and community partnership phases might continue for two decades. The process has implications, she said, for our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren and way beyond. And the decision to proceed, she said, will stay with us for 100,000 years, which really struck me that she kind of like puts herself into this into this time frame, which becomes very kind of effectively compelling in these discussions. Later on, there was a phone in and passionate protests were voiced, which seemed to assume that there were already plans in place and the decision had already been taken. Key sound bites were repeated at regular intervals over the two hours of the programme to elicit further conversation. We will not accept. We will fight all the way. We will protest on the streets if we have to. Somebody else claimed over a thousand people have already signed a petition to throw out the plan. They plan to bury the waste at the old gas works. They think we're an easy target. 
We don't want it here. We're not as weak as they think. A colleague of mine from the advisory committee, who's a materials scientist, was also interviewed and asked to present her independent view on the GDF on this same radio program. She started by pointing out that the um, scenario was not as portrayed in the Simpsons cartoon. It's more boring, she said, and this idea that nuclear power is boring is a very um, central and important rhetoric in the industry. Um, she said the materials that will be deposited are not luminous green sludge. The waste materials have been engineered into glass or concrete blocks and they'll be encased in layers of protective containment. It's not feasible to store these materials on the surface for 100,000 years, especially given our current understandings of the changes that will occur at the surface during this time period. The idea is to design a facility that will lower the risk to future populations. When pushed, she freely admitted that the process is not risk-free, but she stressed that nothing is risk-free. We try to understand how, material, how waste materials might reach the groundwater. The process will be very slow, but scientists are fully engaged in calculating the risk of radioactivity leaving the facility. In order to get a license to operate, that is to receive the waste, the regulators would have to approve the safety case. RWM would have to prove that the risk is negligible and, def and definitively less risky than leaving the materials on the surface. I've no idea whether her intervention shifted anything or not, but somewhat surprisingly, something shifted in this area. And literally two days ago, this um, area declared that a working group had been formed there. And this is far too recent for me to be able to follow up and know exactly what those dynamics are about. I suspect it's probably like Rest Cumbria, there'll be groups who want it and groups who don't want it. And this will be worked out over the coming years and months. So to round up on this part of the talk, I hope to have shown that there is awareness that the geological disposal of highly radioactive waste clearly requires something more than a highly engineered infrastructure. The policy has recognised that this infrastructure must meaningfully involve local populations in different ways and over several generations. However, the GDF is ultimately an infrastructure of extreme detachment built around the imaginary of a highly designed technical facility that is eventually passed from a surface host community to the host rocks underground. So in what follows, I look in more detail at some of the relational dynamics that are currently produced in this transfer of responsibility from the field of human agency to a field of geological agency. So I've called my next section geology and the Anthropocene. Growing awareness of the significance of climate change, environmental degradation and the implications of the Anthropocene as the indelible geological trace of human action articulates mistrust of both government and industry at, different, at a different scale. Fears about the future habitability of the planet are provoked by a newfound awareness of limited resources, fragile environments and the extreme vulnerability of many human and other than human lives. There has been a huge outpouring of work from the broad field of environmental humanities in engaged collaboration with and debate with ecologists, environmental and climate scientists, atmospheric chemistry, engineering and of course geology. Much effort is now directed to fostering conversations about collaboration, about how to live well on and with the earth. These are the contexts in which Nigel Clark's position about a future geologic politics are framed. The opportunity arises from a new appreciation of the dynamism of the earth that, as he puts it, both recognises the geologic agency of certain human populations and acknowledges that such social forces emerge late on an always already volatile planet. Now, contemporary geologists, unlike their 18th century ancestors, are absolutely fascinated by this volatility. The Anthropocene, or the age of the humans, is the term that Paul Crutzen, the atmospheric chemist, came up with almost off the top of his head over 20 years ago now. To point to the significance of the, human, of the imprint of humans on Earth's geology and ecosystems. The concept caught on and, international, and, and the International Commission on Stratigraphy is currently investigating the validity of a claim to a new geological age and the potential time period to which this would refer. Suggestions range from the Neolithic and the first use of fire to the 20th century and the dispersal of radioactive nuclides in the course of nuclear weapons testing. However, the impact is measured, 
there is little doubt that human engineered infrastructures have become coextensive with the wider environment, and not only with the air, the water and the soil, but with the deep subterranean world and its geological complexity. In his wonderful exploration of the underlands of the UK, the author Robert McFarlane describes a journey that he made into the mining shafts deep under the sea of the north coast um, of the of the coast of northeast England, where he's confronted by the extent to which the modern machinery that's being used for extractive mining is routinely abandoned underground, where the very fluid rock formations rapidly come to entomb everything that's left behind so there's this kind of all this kind of underground work that humans do leaves its leaves its detritus behind in it and it becomes very immediately embedded embedded in the rock others have written powerfully about the ways in which many 18th and 19th century urban infrastructures are never are never removed but they're simply built over and effectively producing in some cases, more extensive reserves of certain minerals and metals that actually exist elsewhere to be mined in the wild, so to speak. The promoters of the GDF thus face a somewhat paradoxical situation, as they argue for the responsible removal of radioactive waste from the surface of the planet at a time when human irresponsibility with respect to the deeper geological integrity of the planet might challenge the wisdom of a proposal to further penetrate the subsurface with the deliberate intrusion of radio introduction of radioactive wastes. However, the import of this proposal transforms when the timescales are shifted away from the concerns and fluctuations of the biosphere and thus of human life. The GDF posits a new interface where human ingenuity and geological capacity come together at the point where hosting responsibilities are transferred from the surface to the subsurface. Despite the paradox of an intensified intrusion and the newfound awareness of the importance of the geological grounding of all life forms, the rocks still emerge as the least dangerous and damaging option of how to deal with the waste. Another alternative that has since been ruled out was the waste could be launched into outer space. When I first heard this, I'd assumed that the main problem with this idea would be the intrinsic uncertainty of the launching process. However, the geologists with whom I was discussing this explained that to send radioactive matter into space would actually accelerate the dispersal of its, of its toxicity and open new unforeseen consequences of atmospheric pollution. Deep burial would have the opposite effect. The process of dispersal would be slowed down, engaging a dimension of time that was external to the fluctuations of the surface and of the biosphere. The ultimate aim of the multi-barrier approach to geological disposal is thus to embed the engineered structure in a specific geological environment where human time and the time of radioactivity are collapsed into a single geological moment and thus rendered inconsequential. A hundred thousand years barely registers on the geological time scale, which takes me to tell you about the rocks. There are three categories of rocks that are deemed to meet the requirement for the isolation and containment of the waste. Each of these is chosen for their ability to slow down the movement of the waste um, or to the movement of the radioactive particles. So these three categories are hard rock, claystone and salt rock. Each of these has its own particular strengths and weaknesses. Hard rock is an obvious candidate. In Sweden, for example, the construction of the GDF is about to begin in granite rock that is 1,870 million years old. Now, the challenge with hard rock is that it's brittle and it can contain open fissures and networks that groundwater and gas can flow through. In these environments, the geologists look for evidence of absence of fractures and of absence of hydraulic connectivity. Clay rock has certain advantages over granite because the movement of this rock affords a self-sealing capacity. The rock also has low permeability and a permeability that further decreases over time. So its long-term behavior is deemed to be highly reliable. But clay rock is not as strong as hard rocks like granite and would not as easily withstand the pressure of expansion caused by the heat of the high-level radioactive wastes. A GDF in clay rock would need more space to distribute the waste containers. Salt rock is practically impermeable and like clay, it creeps and thus operates its own self-healing mechanism, but it also throws up challenges. 
not least that it's very difficult to map accurately. Salt structures often remain transparent, and 3D seismic data does not easily reveal the evidence of absence that the geologists need to find. They therefore rely on boreholes, core sampling, and underground geophysical investigations using ground penetrating radar, but these are quite difficult to set up because you have to start with an underground laboratory. So the work of the geologists in search of evidence of stability connects them in many ways to the 18th century roots of the discipline. When the theory of uniformitarianism and consistent gradual change displaced previous theories of catastrophe and abrupt change, which were pretty much erased from the agenda in the 18th century, dismissed as kind of witchcraft and mysticism. The work of James Hutton, Charles Lyell and others established that the Earth's history was actually one of slow geological transformation via processes that unfolded over time at even predictable rates. Their work led to a reappraisal of the age of the planet and completely changed the time horizons of humanity. Their approach was fundamental to the Enlightenment as a way of thinking about human being and human capacities that ushered in what we now look back on as the age of modernity, with its focus on planning and improvement and this kind of necessary sense of kind of continuity on which those ideas depended. Then as now, rocks were approached as semi semiotic repositories, sign systems that held the secrets of the origins and evolution of life on Earth. What changed from previous eras and what has continued to change since has been the methods of observation and interpretation. The meanings of the geological traces of deep time began to be more systematically inferred through the deployment of ideas about prob probability and improbability, new ways of thinking statistically, and most recently new projections both back and forward in time using simulation and modeling techniques. These techniques have in turn made visible the complexities of the geological record. The most spectacular are perhaps the missing years of rock from the Earth's geological re record referred to as the Great Unconformity. The image you have here is, is of the Grand Canyon, which is one of the key um, examples of, of the Great Unconformity, where the, you can see the line that's kind of second from the bottom. Um, this is a line where a time gap between two strata is shown. Um, and this time gap is calculated to be of, of the very least seven. 125 million years. So this kind of what they call lost time appears in the geological record. Questions as to whether the cause of this kind of erasure um, are because of gradual erosions or other more sudden events are still under debate. Either way, geologists, geologists are fascinated by these spaces and refer to them as gaps, these gaps as lost time. Contemporary fascination with abrupt changes and with lost time continue to inflect human understandings of the history of the planet, as well as opening new sites of possibility for resource prospecting, because often where you get these gaps and fissures and all the kind of complications of movement in geology is what is really exciting for most prospecting um, geologists. By contrast with the GDF, so a Swiss geologist who was talking about the rock that they were, the salt rock that they were looking for in, in, um, in Switzerland, explained his choice, um, and a claystone site it was. He said, we have to make sure that the geology makes a good contribution. We need to maximize the contribution of the geology to the multi-barrier system. We excluded the Alps for their rapid uplift rates and other areas for tectonic complexity. We looked for host rock at the right depth and, and thickness. We discounted strongly faulted zones, and we came up with the three most boring sites of Swiss geology. In other words, these were not the sites with the best stories. They were the sites where nothing had been going on for millions of years. So I really like this kind of sense that what they have to look for is evidence of nothing, evidence of literally nothing happening. Research on the geology thus works in two temporal directions simultaneously, in the deep past and the deep future. The deep past is accessed via a range of sampling and scanning techniques, but it remains full of holes. The future is evidenced by analogy, a mode of reasoning that rests on the theory of uniformitarianism. Um, this is just an image of um, 
Vincent Ialenti's ethnographic, a book um, based on his ethnographic work at the Finnish GDF at Onkolo. And he looks in great detail at deep time and gives an example um, of an expert study of a crater lake that resulted from a meteor crashing into the earth some 73 million years ago. And it was um, the work that geologists did by tracing, using an analogy of what had happened over the past 73 million years to help them to decide what was going to happen for the next 73 million years. So if you use this kind of principle of um, uniformitarianism and the idea of gradual and um, unabrupt change, that's what allows them to think right across these huge spaces of time um, to, and to feel that they've got uh, some hold on this idea of what's going to happen in these huge spaces. Geologists do not ignore future dramatic change. They simply search for sites where change will occur in an entirely different time horizon from life on the surface of the planet. Their models anticipate extreme climate change, continental glaciation, seismic activity and human intervention. With the, effect of, with the exception of human intervention, the effects of the other surface processes, as they refer to them, are insignificant. Sea level changes would be negligible over the next 100 to 150 year period of operation when the facility would still be most vulnerable to water intrusion. Continental glaciation is a near certainty over the next 100,000 years, but the geological record gives an assurance of an absolute cutoff for glacial erosion at 200 meters the minimum depth at which a facility would be constructed. The frequency of seismic activity has to be assessed for any site, but the UK is not close to tectonic plate boundaries and thus major earthquakes are also not deemed to be of relevance. Calculations of optimum depth for the DDF, GDF are all again drawn by analogy with previous events of ice age erosion and changes in sea levels. Central to all these calculations by, an by analogy is the recalibration of time. A million years in geological time is but a blink of an eye, 100,000 years barely registers. Thus, despite the clear understanding of the perpetual fluidity of rock, the relative speed of change in the geological environment is such that waste is stabilized by time itself. This still leaves the possibility of human intrusion. There are interesting experiments at all geological disposal sites where thought is given on how to communicate the existence of this underground hazard to future populations in the knowledge that we have no idea whatsoever of what kind of language or communicative process might be significant or intelligible in the far future. The exercise is no different from those attempts that people are undertaking to communicate to possible beings in outer space. At the surface, all the geologists can do is attempt to clarify whether or not the chosen geologists might become of interest to those looking in the future to exploit natural resources. And of course, what cannot be avoided is the possibility that the GDF itself might become one such resource. We reach the point then when we return to the surface and to human time. However powerful the arguments about the ultimate stability of the geology, this infrastructure of detachment still has to be brought into being and its integrity maintained in human time. And here the unconformities begin to multiply, even if we stay within the field of geology itself. Contemporary geology, and here I would include the work of the National Geological Survey, um, which is kind of the main geological source that's drawn on in the UK. This, this survey is prim primarily oriented to resource prospecting, whether for minerals or in relation to the tracing of um, pollution in, and the effects of mining on water courses. From an anthropological perspective, there is very interesting work emerging from these fields of practice as ethnographers follow the ways in which multiple data sources are brought together to produce reliable data in specific times and places, following in detail how the criteria for reliability are assessed and by whom. I was just going to give you a couple of examples so you can see the ways in which this work is being done. So Gisa Veskalnis, for example, she's described the speculative reasoning that prevails in fields such as oil and gas prospecting. And she draws attention to how the search for a potentially valuable resource involves a continual balancing of the cost of the search in relation to the speculative value of what might be discovered. The geology gets entangled with the investment decisions, the different kinds of risks that have to be managed, and the affective force of the resource potential itself. Thus, while the searches are data driven, they also involve all kinds of other embodied understandings. People work 
with the data, but they also work with hunches, expectations, aspirations, and negotiated possibilities. The other example which I found really interesting is done by Andrea Ballestero, an anthropologist who works on water and pollution in Costa Rica. And she draws our attention to the subterranean interfaces where geology, the economy and social concerns intersect. She got very interested in the geological detection techniques that were used to trace how a major oil spill had affected a local water source. She described how the geologists were working not simply on the rocks, but on the subterranean interfaces where nature, the economy and social concerns intersect. She used the example of the plumes of hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon pollutants, learning from the geologists how these were traced and described. Their focus was on the movements of the contaminating hydrocarbons within the movement of the watercourses. They had to detect and trace the form, the size and the speed of the plumes and the types of containment in which they were moving that is the solubility, density, and velocity of the groundwater movement. She observed, she observed that the plumes were described as either migrant or stable, with reference to an image of potentially bordered entities. But she also noticed that the contours of the plume involved textural relations between the intruding substances and the substance in which they were trying to move. And this is a little quotation from her, which was, I thought was very interesting. She says, if contaminants are light, they remain near the upper levels of the saturated zone of the subsurface. If they are heavy, they descend, sinking until they can no longer migrate, attaching themselves to the pores, cracks and grooves of impermeable rocks. The pollution plume is made sense of through concentration and movement rather than connection and stability. That's the end of the quotation. Ballestero argues, argues that it's important to find a way to think about the relationship between the porous rock of the aquifer and the wells from which people were drawing their water. As she puts it, the aquifers are not underground tanks or containers, but sites of dynamic seeping and oozing. The, aqu the aquifers host the contamination plumes. The plume dissolves itself into its host at different concentrations throughout its elongated figure. Ballesteros' argument focuses on the way in which modes of description create a sense of reality, in this case, a disputed legal reality. The case that she followed hinged on the image of the aquifer as a container rather than of the more elastic or topological figure of oscillating concentration and movement. One of the things that caught my attention was the way in which the aquifer was described as host to the plume. And this is the observation that takes me to my final section on the hosting relations and the suggestion that the hosting can take place through ambiguous shape-shifting processes rather than the stark differentiations of discrete entities. And um, thinking back, it helps me to think back to the question of geological politics. I'll go on in my um, final section to think how this figure of geological ambivalence um, might draw on this discussion of hosting. So yeah, this is the final section, host, hosts and guests. If narratives of geological time remove the alarm from the subterranean post-closure life of the radioactive wastes, I want to propose in this final section that the hosting relation seems to offer another layer of reassurance via the analogy between rocks and communities um, that's positing for both of them that the housing of waste is an ethical act. The Swiss geologist wants to ensure that the rock makes a good contribution to the process. He wants it to be effective. At times it seems as if the good con as if a good contribution to the I'm sorry, at times it seems as if the good contribution of the community would simply to be not to make a fuss and to let the engineering work proceed. But they are called to participate as hosts, which is a relationship with strong ethical and moral overtones. What then are the hosting capacities and how might they be cultivated over what is a very lengthy period in human time? This is a large topic to embark on at this point in the paper, but I do want just to touch on it to draw together some of the threads from the previous discussion of the materiality of waste and of geology at the interface with human life and human concerns. In the recent special issue of the JREI um, that I've referred to here, um, Candea and Dacol note the resurgence of anthropological interest in the topic of hospitality. Possibly, they suggest, related to the way that the concept has been taken up 
um, by Derrida, particularly in contemporary philosophy, as a way of thinking about the moral dilemmas of the migrant crisis that emerged in Europe, where the obligations to host a huge number of strangers made evident the clear tensions between an ethos of humanitarian openness and a determination to impose sovereign regulation. Candéa and Dacol track an anthropological genealogy of thought and focus in particular on the work of Pitt Rivers and his interest in the host-guest relation as founded upon ambivalence and the tension between suspicion and trust. Ethnographers have begun to explore the ambivalent quality of hospitality that emerges in a whole range of settings where this ambiguity manifests in the way that people bring together calculation and spontaneity, rule and emotion, the absolute and the limited. These tensions resonate strongly with the dynamics involved in contemporary uh, attempts by the radioactive waste management to broker the key hosting relationships on which the delivery of the GDF depends. On the surface, the hosting relationships are particularly ambivalent, given that the host community itself is only drawn into being through the hosting process. And even if we suspend that complication, it's not clear at what point the community moves from hosting the state, which appears in the guise of RWM, who come with incentives, with criteria, with science, with policy and the financial resources. So at what point do they move from hosting the state to hosting the construction process, where a whole swathe of private companies will arrive with machinery, materials, job contracts, supply chains, and the control of all kinds of movement and circulations. Material of man materials, money, jobs, and information. At a much later stage, different organizations will arrive to begin the operational phase with increased securitization that will surely accompany the radioactive wastes on their journey underground. There is the possibility of protests and occupation at any stage. All of these relationships suggest that the identity of host might easily transform into that of the occupied or the besieged. And once the facility is closed, future generations will no longer host in an active sense. The, ros the rock will have taken over the task of hosting the waste. Marshall Silence famously elaborated on the notion that hosting involves receiving an unknown stranger, an outsider who brings both vitality and sovereignty as promise and threat of radical transformation, as he kind of exemplified in his work on Captain Cook. This sense of a vitalizing presence that intrudes from an external world of greater social power could easily be applied to the emergence of any new infrastructure presence. These are certainly the terms in which the international highway that I studied in Peru was apprehended by people on the ground. And yet the hosting idiom was never to my knowledge deployed in that context. Local communities did not host the road. The road never took up the identity of a self-contained entity such that it could be imagined as being encompassed by a hosting relation. Ethnographers of hospitality have also pointed to the tension between transformation and domestication that hosting implies. The anti-nuclear activists who oppose the GDF clearly fear its capacity to domesticate nuclear power, to make it easy to live with. The concern chimes with concerns about how waste in general is made to disappear by techniques of spatial and temporal distancing, or by rhetoric and other calculative practices that are designed to reassure and to remove any blocks to consumption, which is a topic that um, Catherine Alexander and Patrick O'Hare have um, explored in some detail in a recent collection. These are clearly very important issues, and the decision by the UK government to include the waste from new nuclear facilities and potentially the not yet wastes of the plutonium and enriched uranium stores certainly does complicate the ways in which the public good of the GDF might be assessed. Despite these complications, I remain intrigued by the ways in which a notion of a host community and the notion of a host rock cuts across the field of hosting relations in different ways, ways that are themselves revealing of the unconformities of geological infrastructures and the central role that temporal discontinuity plays in the shaping of their imaginaries. For a start, the host community has to assume the role of host voluntarily. In the projected time frame for the construction of the GDF, it's anticipated that a full agreement to build the facility might take many years. And during this time, the host-guest relation holds a very particular kind of ambiguity. It's not clear whether or not the guest will decide to stay. The volunteer puts himself forward as a candidate who might not be chosen. 
a volunteer community can also decide to end the relationship right until the moment when their test of public support is taken. There is then a lengthy period of exploration and negotiation around the terms of a potential cohabitation while the community lives with the construction phase. And once the radioactive waste material begins to arrive for disposal be below ground, a new phase will begin. For a period of approximately 100 years, the hosting relationship will be shared between those above ground and the rock below. Gradually, the rock will take over the hosting role until ultimately it's, it, it will be presumed that the regulatory agencies of the future will end the phase of human hosting. In short, the imagined coming into being of the GDF reveals an ever-shifting sense of moral, political and economic claims across social spaces where insiders and outsiders can never be definitively defined. In areas where there's a long history of nuclear industry, such as in the Sellafield region of West Cumbria, decades of in and out migration have ensured an unsettled understanding of who are the insiders and who are the outsiders. There will be many issues to negotiate along the way, all with significant legal and financial implications. Even in the near present, there are no certain boundaries to existing political constituencies. So I just have a one page of conclusion. I began with the question of whether the GDF might open possibilities for a new, geo, for a new geologic politics in the age of the Anthropocene. Despite being an unlikely candidate, the policy framing of the GDF could, somewhat accidentally, encourage a new awareness of the interdependence of human life and that of the rocks deep below the surface of the earth. I would argue that the GDF is already fully engaged in a space of geologic politics. The more significant question is whether there is any transformative potential in this space of engagement. The engineers of the GDS are intent on, for, on forging stable relations with the dynamism of stratified earth systems. They also have to reckon with the lethal volatility of highly radioactive matter and the hugely difficult challenge of how to live well with the legacies of nuclear power. They have to engage these questions in ways that takes them far into the future well beyond human time horizons and into geological time. The anthropologist Jerry Z has argued that anthropology and geology are compatible thought spaces and that they're both highly attuned to transformational potential. The GDF has provoked me to think about such transformations at a time when environmental change appears to be almost unstoppable and potentially catastrophic. Nuclear power and its nuclear wastes is a highly controversial figure in this space deeply implicated in environmental pollution in the recent past, from weapons testing to irresponsible dumping of wastes and the ongoing ten tendency to be more enchanted by the next technological possibility than by the need to ensure that the previous overflows have been securely contained. It's a space of disputed sovereignty, of at times unaccountable public investment and of an inward looking securitized environment where there's little room for meaningful public engagement. However, the growing international consensus on the need for a secure long-term isolation of the most hazardous waste does open a different perspective in which technology cannot be extracted from the site in which it is to be built. To deliver a GDF, it will be absolutely necessary to forge alliances both with a specific place above ground and a specific rock formation below ground. There are many uncertainties here. Nuclear agencies and nuclear policymakers are charged with forming partnerships that are beyond their current capacity to imagine. And there are many who are cynical about the possibilities and who suggest, suggest that the money that communities are offered is simply a bribe and that sooner or later a marginal community will be brought off to take the waste. In this case, the hosting relations become entirely rhetorical. And this may be how things turn out. But experiences from elsewhere suggest that this buy-off is never quite so easy and negotiations around the ambivalent sociality of hosting will unfold. It is perhaps in the spaces of such negotiations that a future Earth politics can be progressed. The studies we do today can only be initial steps of a process that people may be following well into the next century. Setting out some markers on the infrastructural initiatives at the beginning of the process may nevertheless help to explain something of how things began in the way they did. Thank you. Thank you.